iNews did indeed just last week come out with its losing ground report uh, based on, as, as many of you know, significant census analysis from 1960 up to 2010 and based on their reporting, uh, as Dr. Harding has mentioned, has been discussed in Colorado Public Radio, in very clear-cut material terms, blacks, Hispanics, uh, Latino brothers and sisters here in the state, both in economic terms, uh, with respect, as Linda had mentioned, the educational system have, have, have lost ground, not necessarily gained ground, as some individuals might assume. This report didn't necessarily come as a surprise to everyone, right? But the, the, specific, the specificity with which the report details um, this, this, this absence of, of traction despite the blood that has been shed since 1960, 1963. Um, would anyone here like to just respond? And then we're going to open this up very quickly. Um, I think one thing I've noticed happening socially in Denver is that I think the, the way people are moving and the demographic and kind of geographic shifts in neighborhoods is one where I experience my life in Denver as very much one in a bubble. I think socially there's a lot of excitement about sort of things happening artistically and musically in Denver, and I think it's very easy for that community to become very insular and be very detached from even what's happening in southwest Denver, not to mention Aurora and other communities where there are becoming much more diverse communities. So I think, you know, I think there's a real need for people in Denver community, people in the white community in Denver, I think there's a need to identify and name this kind of insular bubble in the way that it then ignores the stories of so many other people um, and to start confronting that. I think events like this are the perfect way to do that. <laughs> okay, uh, my name is Steve Shepard. Uh, I grew up in, in Lawrence, Kansas, and uh, there's some speculation actually that the Civil War started right there in Lawrence, That's Kansas. That's true. That's true. Uh, Missouri was a slave state. Kansas was a free state. Um, in my interest in, in history, uh, because I did come through the civil rights era uh, while a student at KU with sit-ins and going to jail and all of that, but um, there have been two questions that, that have come up. One was, uh, what does it take to have a backlog of leadership in a movement like this? Um, and I'm in a, a reenactment group, and uh, our coordinator developed a program and was uh, called Where's the Gumption? Or Where Did the Gumption Go? And we would, uh, you know, take this to classrooms and even uh, had one session at Blair Caldwell where we had a, a group of adults. And the question was, and uh, I would present Barney Ford, as you know, Barney Ford was very instrumental in petitioning Congress so that uh, the state of Colorado would not come into the Union without African Americans being able to vote. So we would uh, portray these historical characters and ask those students and ask the adults, where is the gumption? And quite frankly, one of the things that that was very disturbing to me was that um, we discovered that from a time standpoint, from an event standpoint, this, this laboratory that you talk about wasn't an even paced laboratory. It came in fits and spurts. And what really motivated people were violent and often disruptive social events. And my question is, can this, can this laboratory exist without that type of disruptive event? My name is Tamara Rohn and um, I am an educator of 36 years. I've retired and still continue to teach African American history and U.S. history. 
I was born in Denver, Colorado in 1954, and I've lived this, and I hate to tell you, but um, I deal with a lot of ever-present anger because I see the fits and spurts, and my answer to you is, I think it's gonna continue in fits and spurts. I got caught up um, you know, in the whole busing thing uh, before it happened. My parents decided to send me to St. Mary's Academy, and that's when I think the ever-present anger really set in because I was treated terribly. And I still see that happening to black children in private schools. I still see children that are not being treated fairly in public schools. I still see where we take five steps ahead and then we're yanked 10 steps back when it's okay for a sitting governor to wag her finger in a sitting president's face and she's not brought to the ground. I just, I see it continuing. And so my only answer is we just have to stay in the fight to make a change because the majority of people that I know within my circle of all races, colors, creeds, are good people. The problem seems to be the others, but you have to identify the others. Um, thanks for Thanks for what you're doing here. Uh, my name is Alexander Stevens. I'm from Athens, Georgia. Um, actually, it's been a while in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where those a lot of those photos were taken um, that were shown before the program started. Um, I guess just real quickly to respond to your question, um, I think something for us to think about is that there are lots of forms of violence that are taking place. That, the way I, I may have misunderstood your question, the way I understood it was that. Um, you know, does it take a sort of violent outburst to motivate people to action? Is that, yes. is that right? Okay. So it, it seems to me that like, like what you're saying, the violence has continued. There's all these different forms of violence going on. Mass in, the mass incarceration of uh, people of color and low-income people in our country is a tremendous form of violence that generates a lot of anger. The inequity in the schools, like you were describing, is violence in, in, in some form. And so to me, it gets back to the, the popular education question how do we talk about these things with the people who are most affected by it um, and motivate them to action and, and, and frame it in such a way that it is framed as violence because I think that's what it is. And so I'd be interested to know what you, what you think about that um, from your experience as an educator or yours um, yeah. uh, as far as how, how that can be framed for students coming up. Um, well, Dr. Hardy talks about the river okay. uh, of struggle. Uh, Paul Ortiz talks about um, uh, what he refers to as, as African-American testimonial culture um, and, the, and the purpose of that testimonial culture is to share that story of the unbroken tradition of struggle. That there are times when we're less aware of it. Okay? I mean, we tend to think, you know, there was a civil war in Reconstruction um, and then some stuff happened in the 20s with the Harlem Renaissance and those movements. And then we fast forward to, um, to um, Rosa Parks, you know, sitting on the bus. So the, consequently, the version that, and I swear I'm not making this up, a number of you have heard this many times before, so that our children end up with a narrative that goes something like, Martin Luther King freed the slaves, and then he and Rosa Parks got married, and now we're all sitting on the front yeah. of the bus. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I've heard some version yeah. of this, you know, all over the country. 